Hi, my name is Corby Arthur, and I am the patient, uterine cancer patient uh, support coordinator for SHARE Cancer Support. And before our presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms because no one should have to face cancer, uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. I am pleased to, to present Dr. Alan Lee, who is a board certified radiation oncologist at UCLA. He completed a fellowship in brachytherapy at UCLA in 2019. Prior to this, he finished his residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in 2018. Dr. Lee earned his medical degree, MD, from SUNY Upstate Medical University in 2013. Dr. Lee has a particular clinical and research interest in thoracic malignancies, radiation, as well as procedures and brachytherapy. So Dr. Lee, we're interested in hearing about lung metast metastases. Yeah, thank you for that um, great introduction. I really appreciate it and the opportunity to talk um, with the Share Cancer uh, Support Group. Um, today, we'll be talking a little bit about local therapies for lung metastases, like you mentioned. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm Alan Lee. I'm a radiation oncologist at UCLA, uh, David Geffen School of Medicine. Uh, I have some slides I'm going to share. Let's see if I can get this. Let's see. Part get this to they edit. <laughs> yeah. Can you see that? Perfectly. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so lung uh, local therapy for lung metastasis this is the focus of our conversation or our talk today. Um, the local different local therapies are generally categorized into surgery, radiation, or local ablation therapies. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the differences between the three. Surgery is relatively self-explanatory in the sense that it involves resecting or removing part of the lung, which contains the tumor that we're trying to get rid of. This can be done via wedge resection, which is a smaller surgery, or a segmentectomy, which is a slightly larger surgery of a segment, or lobectomy, which is removing an entire lobe. The most extreme would be a pneumonectomy, which is very uncommonly done for metastatic disease, but um, could be done in rare circumstances. The advantage of surgery is that you would be able to get pathology, which can then be looked at under the microscope and determined what type of molecular subtype it is or um, any other systemic therapies that might be allowed to target that particular type or molecular profile of cancer. Uh, ablations, which are done via a needle inserted from the outside of the body through the chest wall into the lung, use primarily either heat or cold to destroy the cancer cells that are within the lung. The needle is heated to a temperature or cooled to a temperature that causes necrosis or destruction of the cancer. This can have some side effects, which can be bleeding or pneumothorax, which is air trapped between the lung and the outside of the chest, uh, outside of the lung, which is the chest uh, pleura. This also requires a procedure and usually does not require an overnight stay, but if there's a significant amount of air trapped between the lung and the pleura, but the lung and the chest wall, then there might have to be an overnight stay for observation purposes. Um, I'll get a little bit into, you know, a bit more about it later, but there's many different types of types of ablations. Um, the focus of my treatments is radiation therapy and whereby we deliver ionizing radiation from the outside, very similar to getting a CT or an X-ray, <clears throat> very similar to getting a CT or an X-ray. There's no pain or burning or anything like that. The radiation is delivered 
the radiation is delivered from the outside via high-powered X-rays, and the beams on the machine convalesce on one point, similar to spokes on a tire or spotlights on a stage, and the full dose of radiation goes to the center, and as you get further away from the center, you get less and less radiation. The dose drop-off is quite sharp for these treatments. The side effects from treatment you might see about halfway through the treatment course can be fatigue or tiredness. Some people can also have some slight skin irritation. In the longer term, meaning three months or more after you finish the treatment, some patients, a small percentage of patients, can get radiation pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lung for radiation. What this usually looks like is a cough, maybe a more severe version. You can get a cough requiring steroids. And then the most severe would be an inflammation so severe that it causes you to put in the hospital with a pneumonia that is quite rare. Probably the percentage of patients that have any side effect, um, meaning any lung side effects, would be about maybe 10%. And then having severe side effects enough to be on steroids or going into the hospital for this type of treatment in the treatment of lung cancer or lung metastases would be very small, you know, a couple percentage points maybe. The acronyms you might see when getting lung radiation um, would usually include IMRT or SBRT. I put on the screen there, IMRT is the intensity modulated radiation therapy and SBRT is stereotactic body radiotherapy. But simply put, one just means more than five treatments and one means and the other one means one to five treatments of radiation. These are usually delivered daily, although some institutions might deliver them every other day. Most of my patients that get radiation say they didn't even know they were getting the radiation, except for the fact that large machines found them. And um, you know, I don't really get too many complaints about it. Um, but other other procedures can also have similar efficacy, but usually carry with them more or different side effects entirely. Um, I thought I would maybe pause here for a second, and um, maybe we can answer some questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, so what are the guidelines on whether or not you do a biopsy and how do you know if you don't biopsy? How do you know what you've got if you don't biopsy? Yeah, so usually um, on a scan, lesions will look relatively able to, relatively similar. I mean, let me rephrase. Usually on a scan, it's usually pretty obvious if it's a metastatic lesion versus a primary lung cancer lesion. Oftentimes when patients already have a primary cancer that is metastatic, it's presumed that the lung lesion is a metastatic lesion. Sometimes we'll get a biopsy in order to evaluate for possible targeted therapies or to confirm the fact that it is a metastasis. The Confirmation of metastatic disease sometimes isn't necessary if there's been confirmation in other sites. So it really depends heavily on the situation. If, it, if we're super convinced that it's a metastatic site and there's no reason to get pathology, oftentimes we'll just proceed with treatment. If we do need pathology and there's lots of and there's lots of areas that are involved in one lobe, potentially a lobectomy or surgery to remove that lobe might allow for and the analysis of that pathology um, without a biopsy, because that would function as a biopsy. Uh, when doing thermoablations, they can also do a biopsy prior to the thermoablation. However, it requires a different needle entirely to do so. They have to follow the other needle down using a larger needle used for ablations, whereas the biopsy needle is much smaller than the ablation needle. Thank you. And um, what are the guidelines or how do you decide which treatment is best? Yeah, so there's a lot that go into that. You know, it's a lot like asking a, a watchmaker how a watch is made. Um, but for the most part, if you have one lesion that is fairly away from important structures, that radiation has the highest local control of all the of all the treatments. No, well, maybe surgery is higher, but uh, between ablation and radiation, radiation has a much higher local control. And we're able to sculpt our beam much more exactly around important organs or structures that we're trying to avoid. If we need pathology and there's a large tumor and it's involving just one lobe, that potentially surgery would be an option 
for candidates that are very good surgical candidates or otherwise don't have issues with getting surgery. And then we would do ablation sometimes when there, let's say there's seven or eight or nine lesions that if I were to do radiation on a large portion of the normal lung would get a lot of radiation, in which case we would use ablations in order to uh, pick off the lesions one by one and also allowing for active surveillance afterwards because radiation causes a scar to be formed, which makes it difficult to see surrounding normal lung um, in regards to continued surveillance over time. Well, thank you. Um... How long, well, I guess you said how many treatments, but like how long are um, all these, these radiation treatments, how, how long can a patient expect to? Yeah, so usually we would do a CT scan for radiation treatment planning, and then about a week later, we would start the radiation. The radiation treatments are about 15, 30 minutes long. The beam is only on for maybe five to 10 minutes at most. A lot of the time is spent just lining the patients up every day perfectly and making sure that the target is right on. And we would do that by doing a cone beam or a miniature CT scan, which is not a very high resolution scan, but it's used to line up the patients every day um, internally. And that way we know we're hitting the right target, um, not missing or hitting any other important organs. Um, and usually we do the treatments. We used to do it every other day. And now we do it every day or every other day. I allow my patients to come whenever they think is easiest for them. I have patients that come from quite far and they want to do all their treatments condensed as fast as possible. I have some patients that come from quite far and they want to make a three hour drive only every other day. And of course that's fine with me also. There's no difference in efficacy or toxicity we find between daily versus every other day or every third day treatments. Oh, that's good to know. And well, you already explained our side effects. So, but how long do people, can it be till people go back to their normal activities? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, for the most part, a lot of my patients don't get any fatigue. So I would say maybe one in every three patients gets fatigue. And maybe of those one in every three, a smaller percentage get very severe fatigue. But that fatigue, even at the most severe, is usually gone by a month. So a lot of my patients don't even notice they're getting radiation, so they return to activities the next day. Some of them get some fatigue and they're a little bit under the weather for a while and they get back to their activities by about three or four weeks. But most people um, are able to function on a daily basis for their normal activities the next day on the issue. Thank you. And um, so we hear about something called proton radiation therapy. Is that an option? What are pros and cons? Yeah, so proton therapy is akin to having a sharper scalpel for a surgeon. Um, the Advantage of that is that potentially you'd be able to spare more normal tissues with a sharper scalpel. But on the flip side, more importantly, potentially would be the person that's holding the scalpel or the operating room that the procedure is being done in, which would include onboard imaging on the machine and then also the physicians that are uh, delivering the radiation. Um, and maybe even more importantly is that there's been lots of data suggest lots of people, physicians that think that protons is better. And so Many, many millions and millions of dollars have been spent comparing radiation photons versus protons. And only in very few circumstances is protons better. And lung is not one of them. And neither is breast or prostate. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I think I think I'm okay with the questions right now. <laughs> you want to go on? Um, yeah, so I, I don't have too too much else to 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 talk about. Um but essentially, there's very good options for treatment of metastatic disease. A lot of the time, patients don't want a huge surgery because um, it puts them out for a while. And usually after a surgery, you can't get chemo or systemic therapy for a while while you're recovering. Whereas radiation, we would just pause or pause the, the chemo or radiation or something, or sorry, pause the chemo or systemic therapy. And I would actually do the radiation in between cycles. So there's really no delay at all anyway, a lot of the time. Um, ablations are also quite good too. If I have patients that have a, more than a few metastases, I will send them to my interventional radiologist, which is a separate department from my department that would use the thermal ablations. Um, I work with them very closely um, in order to treat these patients. Um, the last thing that I did want to mention is we also have a very novel technique here at UCLA called HDR brachytherapy for the lung. This is delivered very similar to an ablation where a needle is inserted from the outside into the tumor. 
And we actually load that needle with a radioactive isotope and thereby treating radiation with radiation from the inside out. This treatment modality is not necessarily um, done very many places. Um, and so we do use it on occasion for patients that have previously had radiation before and cannot get another course of radiation from the outside and cannot get surgery and cannot get an ablation for whatever reason, that we have an option here at UCLA for patients that don't have any other good options. And I've used that um, probably like my, in my group, we use it probably three times a month among the three of us that actually um, are trained to do that. So I think that for patients that are having lung metastases that would like their questions answered, I think having them come to see a physician at UCLA is you know, more than a good idea. Um, we work very closely with the medical oncologists that refer us patients, as well as the gynecologic oncologists. And so um, it's a very collaborative effort here at UCLA to determine the best plan going forward for our patients. Um, and so, you know, always happy to help or have discussions with patients and um, providers as needed. Thank you. And we ha I have one more question. Sure, absolutely. Um, most of us are always concerned about, about this, um, about recurrence. So how do you monitor patients for, missed, um, you know, what's the best way? Yeah, so typically your primary oncologist or medical oncologist or gynecologic oncologist will be doing imaging or metastatic disease every six to 12 weeks around. Um, from a radiation standpoint, the radiation control rate to a metastasis is over 90%. So we assume that it works until it doesn't. We do a scan every three to six months afterwards, really to surveil for other lesions that might pop up or to look at how the area forms a scar over time. But we assume that that scar is cancer-free and really the scar just helps us determine whether or not a patient is going to, is going to be getting radiation pneumonitis or to some organ nearby that maybe is um, getting some scar tissue formation around or in it that we want to talk to people about. Um, and then also it allows us to see if other lesions have popped up nearby. So really it's not to look at this primary area at all. And so typically we defer systemic imaging or imaging of the body to the person that's prescribing you a systemic therapy, such as chemo and immunotherapy or targeted cancer. So these um, these um, uh, scans, are they mostly PT, PET CT scans, MRIs? What, what it, is it a variety of scans that you use? Typically, we would just do a CT scan um, for the most part. A PET scan, although it provides us more information, sometimes the information is not necessarily very useful. It, PET scans pick up infection as well as inflammation in addition to cancer. So anything that's proliferating very rapidly um, or having um, uptake of, of the sugar can make the PET scan look bright. And so even a radiation, post-radiation tumor can be bright because of inflammation that's happening. And so then it doesn't really provide us additional information. The PET scans are overall good for looking at systemic therapy because hopefully if you're getting appropriate systemic therapy, the general brightness of the PET scan should go down slightly in terms of all the tumors that you have. But for radiation, the tumors can actually be brighter um, in the first one, two, or three months after you finish the radiation. And even radiation necrosis or radiation fibrosis or radiation pneumonitis, which is inflammation from radiation, can look bright on a PET scan. So, um, you know, we don't hang our hat on that scan too, too much. Again, you know from historical series that if your control rate is 95%, then doing these scans um, we have to always sort of err on the side of thinking that it's working rather than not working. Otherwise, you're subjecting patients to a lot of negative biopsies. Right. Wow. Well, that was really great information, Dr. Lee. And sure. you answered, I know you answered most of our questions, yeah. all of the questions as far as I can tell. Um, so I, I thank you and very, very much for presenting today. And Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Okay. I'm, I'm going to stop recording.